Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to this short, let's say, intermediate video. Um, until now we have learned quite a bit about dynamical systems, in particular linear systems of the form x dot equals a times x. And now, before we continue, I would like to take this video to give you a quick introduction in, in a little bit more detail in a popular example from mechanics. Right, and this is useful, I guess, because we are going to use this quite a couple of times from now on. And also to show you a few principles in terms of modeling when we have very simple systems. Right? We will later on see that if we have more complicated laws or, or, or behavior, it is not so easy to model this. But for this rather simple system, it's actually quite easy to model this mathematically. Right? Here we don't need data. Later we will need data and machine learning because we cannot model it as, as it is from, from these first principles. But here we can. And so the system I'm going to study is the so-called spring mass damper system. And it's actually quite easy. We have a mass here, and it's connected to a fixed wall with a spring that has a stiffness uh, coefficient k, and to a damper d that, when it's in move motion, dampens the movement. Right? And so the only degree of freedom we have for now is the position of this mass. Right? It can move left and right. We are not considering vertical movements here. So this horizontal coordinate S of t is well the, the state of the system we are interested in. And so as I said, right, later we may need data, but here what we do need is a, a law, a right-hand side, and this can be obtained using Newton's law, which is F equals m of a, m times a, or well, the sum of forces acting on the body equals mass times acceleration. And so if we do this here, and I will comment on this in a, in a second, Let's do this. What I get is two forces acting on this mass. Right? So what we will have is if the mass moves to the right, the spring will pull it back. Right? And it will pull it back proportional to the elongation of the spring. So the spring force is k, so the stiffness coefficient, times the position of the mass. Right? If I move it right, the force turns left. This is why I have a minus sign. And the dampening force does a similar job, but dampening is proportional to the velocity. Right? So if the mass moves very slowly, there's basically no dampening effect. If it moves quickly, there's damping. And so the damping is proportionate to the velocity. And in the same way, if the mass moves right, the damping force turns into the other direction. So we have the second term, the damping constant times the velocity, so the time derivative of the position, and this is all the forces we have here, equals mass times the acceleration. So this is the change in velocity over time, or the second derivative of the position. Okay? And so here we have, as I said, right, for the simple system, using Newton's law only, a mathematical equation that defines the system dynamics. But this looks a little bit different from what we know. Right? This is what we call a second order differential equation, because we have a second derivative in time, and we would now like to get this classical state space description that we had earlier. All right, so what we can do now is we introduce new variables. Okay, so what I'm going to say is I'm going to say that my state variable x of t is composed of the position s of t and also the velocity s dot of t. Okay, so these are my x1 and x2 variables. So uh, this is x1 of t and x2 of t. Okay, so we see here now it's uh, the second order ODE in one dimension becomes a first order ODE in two dimensions. And so now I can rather easily write down the, the equation I have for this one. x of t is um, in the first component, so the, the time derivative s, the time derivative of s is s dot, which is x2, right? So this one is s dot of t, which will give me in the end x2 of t. And the derivative of the second component, so x2 dot is s dot dot. Right now we have, we have the vector, and what you can see here is this is the rule that we derived from Newton's law. 
So I can simply say this is minus, I divide by m, k over m s of t, which is the x1 here, minus d over m s dot of t, which is our x2. Okay, so this looks very, very nice, um, and we can make it look even nicer if we recognize that this is actually a linear system, right? There's only linear terms, which means I can extract the x1, x2 vector, which will give me in the end 0, 1. I'll get to this in a second, and here minus k over m, and here minus d over m times x of t. Okay, so you see 0 times x1, 1 times x2 gives me this first uh, equation, minus k over m x1, minus d over m x2 gives me the second row. So very, very nice. And we see that we actually have a system of the form that we had before. This is our a times x of t. Okay, so very simple example where we get such a linear system. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to study a little bit what happens if I change parameters in my system, okay? So to make this easier, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to assume that the mass is simply one. I'm also going to assume that the spring constant is also equal to one. And I'm going to study the system properties in terms of the dampening coefficient d, right? And so if I do this, my A matrix, now in blue, so the special case for, for these quantities, becomes 0, 1, and in the second row, minus 1, and here what remains is minus D. Okay, so, and what we have not discussed until now, but what we will see in later videos as well, is the question of whether a system is stable, the question of whether a system may oscillate or not, and this is what we can study. Um, in terms of a parameter. Okay, so what are we going to study? We are going to study the dependence on D, obviously, how strong the dampening is. And I guess you can imagine if we do not damp the system at all, it should oscillate forever. If we have strong dampening, something different should happen than maybe in the situation where we have weak dampening. Okay, and so how you study this is, and we will see this in the next video on stability, is via the eigenvalues of the matrix A. So we study the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And how you do this is you solve the eigenvalue equation, right? We are not going into the details. This is something you should know. So A times V is equal to lambda times V, right? So an eigenvector v and an eigenvalue lambda should solve this equation. And how you do this usually is you solve the characteristic polynomial for this problem. Um, so what you do is you find the determinant of a minus lambda times the identity matrix. Right? So what we do is we subtract minus lambda from this diagonal. Okay, and then we compute the determinant. And the way we do this is we take the product of the diagonal entries and subtract the product of the off diagonal entries in a 2D case, right? So what we get is, we get minus lambda times minus D minus lambda minus the off diagonal minus, and this is minus one times one, gives me minus one. And this has to be zero. This is how we find eigenvalues, right? And so if I, you know, sort out all the, the, the minus signs, what I get is this quadratic equation, lambda squared plus d times lambda plus one is zero. And this can easily be solved using the standard PQ formula, right? So what we now get is the solution of this is lambda one and two is uh, minus D over two, plus minus, and then the square root of this term over two, so D 
squared over 4 minus the q part, so the last one, minus 1. Okay, and as I said, the eigenvalues are a bit abstract at this point. We will get to the point to see that these are really relevant and important um, to determine the system behavior. What we see now is we have three cases, right? Um, we have the case 1, where this entry is a positive number, right? So the d squared over 4 minus 1 is positive. This means we have d minus d half plus minus something that is in absolute value smaller than d half. So we will have two distinct real negative eigenvalues. So this gives me two real eigenvalues smaller than zero. We have the second case that this is exactly zero, right? So a, a very special um, borderline case. So we say d squared over 4 minus 1 is equal to 0, which means we have a double eigenvalue, right? One lambda 1 and lambda 2 is minus d half. So duplicate eigenvalue. Um, it's a special case, not so easy to treat, um, but still this can happen. And then there's the case, this is the most interesting one, I would say, because here we have a negative value, okay? And this is also what's something we observe, let's say, in nature most often if we talk about these oscillating systems. If we have that this is negative, then we get a negative number square root. This gives me a complex number, okay? So what I will get is a complex conjugate eigenpair. Right, which means I have a negative real part minus d half, and I have a complex part which is, you know, i times the square root of this. And so this is actually the most interesting case for many, many applications, um, as, and this is the final comment I'm going to make. If you look at this and see um, complex eigenvalues, we will see that the real part is important for stability purposes. Right? We have in the first ODE video, we have seen that a positive a exponent was uh, re responsible for instable behavior, a negative one was responsible for convergence to zero. And so let's consider this in a very simple way now, right? We are going to do this in more detail later, e to the lambda t, and let's assume that the lambda is now a complex number, which means this is e to the a plus j times b t. And so I can use a few rules, right? This gives e to the at times e to the j dt. And so you see Euler's law tells me that this e to the at remains, and this term will give me cosine and sine terms, right? So I get e to the at times cosine of bt plus j, where j is the complex imaginary number now, sine of bt. Okay, and so you see the real part is responsible for growth or decay over time. You know, we've seen this in the scalar example. The imaginary part is responsible for oscillations, right? And don't worry about this real and, and imaginary part. We are not going to go into the depths here. Only remember that also when we study about systems that we identify from data, and we will learn maybe eigenvalues from identified matrices, these eigenvalues will give us a lot of information about oscillating behavior and also about growth or decay. And we will learn more about this in the upcoming videos. Thank you.